Alright! Today is Friday, November 4th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities this week and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Happy Friday night. This is a Friday night special. Which goes without saying that since we're doing a Friday night special, the members only video will be on Monday, not this Sunday. Although, I might throw a surprise on your way, so stay tuned. But folks, apologies for the absence last night. I had a bad voice day. I took a whole bag of Ricola. Nothing, nothing is going on. It felt as I was in one of those uh, Jordan Peele movies where I can't speak and my eyes are just gazing big. And some of you say, hey Maverick, every time you take a break, the market goes higher. What's going on? And I say, But I'm not going no place. Healthy is a shine box. Oh, this guy. But oh boy. Was today's action something or what? The market was up and down, up and down, up and down. A roller coaster ride. And the pie factory was busy, busy, busy. A lot of fingers, a lot of pies. A lot of funny actions happening in the market right now. You know, with the midterm phenomenon and all that stuff. But here's what really moved the market today. In the morning, we got some news that the Australian Central Bank is becoming hawkish. They're gonna raise interest rates more aggressively. And the Australian dollar shot up higher. And then we got another 180 from the Bank of Canada. You see, in the beginning, they went from 75 to 50, thinking that Jerome Powell will do the same. And they will be embarrassed if they do 75. But now that Jerome Powell came out and he whacked the little heads of these uh, pivot crowd. Now the Bank of Canada came out and said, oh, did we say we're going to pivot and do 50? Yeah, that was a mistake. Now we're going back to 75 and the rates are going to go higher and higher and higher. And of course, the Australian dollar, the Kiwi, the Canadian dollar shot up higher in the morning. But the US dollar, you'd think it's supposed to go down when other currencies are rallying higher. But the dollar stuck to its guns. Why? Because the dollar was waiting for the jobs report. And of course, the jobs report came out, whatever number they give us, who cares? We know that all of these numbers are cooked. And after the midterms, they're going to say, oh, did we say the economy created 261,000 jobs in October? Whoops. We meant the economy lost 261,000 jobs in October. But who cares? The private ADP report says the economy lost a lot of jobs in mining. The government report says we created jobs in mining. So who knows? But here's the bottom line. This report came out vanilla. Meeting expectations, nothing special here at all. The cooks delivered. The cooks gave us a beautiful job here out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics kitchen. This vanilla number makes the administration look good before the midterms, but it's also not strong enough to crash the stock market. As to suggest, hey, Mr. Powell of the Fed, we just got another extra spicy jobs report. And now you have to hike rates even higher. It wasn't the case. The number came out meeting expectations. So what was the dollar's reaction at that point? It went down big. But here's the point I want to make. Market bulls and these dip buyers are absolutely delusional at this point. I explained to you before that market bulls are in the bargaining stage of grief. So before the Fed chairman came out and smashed their little heads and all of their dreams of a pivot, they were saying, oh, the economy is getting weaker. Oh, the economy is going to blow up. The Fed has to stop. The economy cannot handle it anymore. And now that the Fed killed their hopes and dreams, and they get this employment report, they came out and said, oh, the economy is actually strong. The economy can handle interest rate hikes. And the soft landing might happen after all. You see how delusional they are? And on top of that, before all of this took place, we got another piece of fake news once again. The rumors that China is about to reverse the uh, zero thing policy and end the lockdowns, which, by the way, also added more pressure on the dollar because when you have the yuan, the Japanese yen, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Kiwi all rising higher, the dollar succumbed to the pressure and went down big. But the bulls look at this news, the rumors from China, and they say, oh, look at this. Oh, China's about to reopen. That's another good news for the stock market. And I say, wait a minute here. If China's about to reopen, isn't this inflationary? Isn't that going to push commodities prices higher, as we've seen today? Oil almost back at 100, metals surging higher. And if inflation goes higher, isn't it the case that the Fed will come out even more aggressive in interest rate hikes? Whoops. And by the way, all of this crap about China reopening, the Chinese authorities came out and said, 
These are rumors, and China is resolutely adhering to the Thing Zero policy. The rumors have no basis. We're not going to reopen. So if you continue to buy the dip in Chinese stocks, or you buy the dip in the stock market with the thesis that, oh, China is about to reopen, in essence, you're fighting Xi Jinping. Uh, wait till Xi Jinping huge and tows your ass. You really want to fight this guy? You haven't learned your lesson fighting the Fed? Now you want to fight Xi Jinping? The hell is wrong with you? But rest assured, the bulls have another theory now. Okay, the soft landing is not going to happen. The pivot is not going to happen. China ending lockdown is not going to happen. But wait for it. How about GOP optimism? Red wave optimism, baby, next week, right? Or, or the red wave optimism now. What do you think Bitch McConnell is going to do out of his shell? And I'm not talking about his turtle shell. I'm talking about his shell account in the Cayman Island. You think the GOP will rescue your portfolio now and help the stock market go higher? Okay, let's play that game. Sure, let the stock market shoot up higher all the way to the elections and the aftermath of the elections. But then we got the CPI. And all what you have to do is look at gasoline prices in the month of October versus the month of September. They went significantly higher. So the CPI will come out and crush all of these hopes and dreams and fantasies. I should say. And then what? What is the next theory? Oh, oh, the Santa Claus, right? Oh, Santa Claus is going to come to the rescue. Wait till Santa delivers the bags. And then what comes after Santa? Oh, how about God? God optimism. Maybe God is going to come down and fix it for us, right? It's not like he has better things to do, like looking out for Jupiter and Uranus. But folks, and by the way, if you happen to be a new viewer and you're watching the show right now and you clicked on the title, 40% of small businesses did not pay a rent in October. And all of a sudden the guy's talking about the market. What's going on here? What is this clickbaiting? Feel free to scroll all the way to the in focus segment because this is when we talk about small businesses and rent. But for now, I gotta teach these people something here, because a lot of you, unfortunately, are accustomed to trading by looking at charts, and that's all you do. So the market opens in the morning, and it is gapping higher. And you look at the action, and you're like, is this a bear flag? Is this a bull flag? Is this a pig? Is this a monkey? Is this a donkey? Whatever zoo animals you wanna name. But your boy, the Maverick Wall Street, doesn't roll that way. Matter of fact, I always always write some notes before the open. And I'm a simple man, folks. I like my steak medium rare. I like my wine red, my whiskey neat, my weed strong, and my woman freaky. Simple stuff that most guys can relate to. So when I see the action in the morning, I ask myself two questions. What is the dollar doing? And what are yields doing? Because we know that when the dollar goes higher, this is negative to energy, Bitcoin, chips, and metals. When the dollar goes down, this is positive, to commodities in general, but mostly energy, metals, also Bitcoin and chips. Likewise, when yields go higher, this is negative to real estate, utilities, home builders, and tech. When yields go down, this is positive for real estate, utilities, home builders, and tech. So what was going on in the morning before the open? The dollar was down big. So this is supposed to be positive for energy, Bitcoin, chips, and metals. And yields were pretty much flattish. They weren't up, they weren't down. So right off the gate, I'm looking at the dollar and how can I trade the move in the dollar? Now, do I take the risk in buying chips? Because chips are part of technology and technology doesn't look good. Yields did not move down significantly at all and the charts are looking horrible. Do I go with uh, tulips, Bitcoin? Sure, maybe. I'll play that for a day or two. No problem. Do I go with metals? Maybe. Maybe I'll buy some calls on uh, Alcoa to play aluminum or Freeport McMoran to play copper. But I'm not sure that the dollar is going to continue to go down. So I play these for a day or two and we're done. But what has been the consistent theme so far? Every time when the dollar goes down, energy shoots up higher. And energy been shooting up higher even when the dollar was surging higher because the tailwinds for energy remain intact. Likewise, when I see the big cap technology names such as Apple rallying in the morning, meanwhile yields are not really going down significantly, I view that as a pop to short. And this is exactly what I said. When I see the dollar down, I double down on energy longs and I use the pops in tech to short. Now you might say, but Maverick, uh, tech went higher by the end of the day. Yeah, who cares? The weekly charts are absolutely abysmal. And sooner or later, these names are going down. And now you might say, hey Maverick, but energy did not go up by a lot. I say a lot of names went up big. But all in all, it was kind of a muted reaction considering the move down in the dollar and how big it is. But we have technical resistance right now in the majority of energy names. I'm going to show you that in the charts analysis. But the technicals aside, the fundamentals remain strong. These companies are producing record profits. We have historic shortages in inventories 
nationwide. We have a depleted SPR that has to be refilled and replenished at some point. We have OPEC Plus, and they're going to keep a put on oil prices from going down. And if you say China is about to reopen, that is yet another tailwind for energy to move higher as the Chinese demand comes back into market. But most importantly, the cherry on top, the dollar is going down now. And if the dollar goes down, the demand for commodities move higher, which is another added tailwind for oil to move higher. And the only remaining headwind against oil is the Federal Reserve tightening the monetary policy and hurting the demand. But we know that the Fed is far behind the curve. Whatever they're doing right now, this headwind can be easily defeated by all of these tailwinds, at least for now. So with the dollar down, I view the energy trade as, you can't lose. You can't lose. We can't lose. We can't lose. We can't lose. We can't, we can't lose. lose. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, we're going to talk about this and a lot more in tonight's program. But before we start, Thank you to all of the members of the channel, and if you can support the channel by joining, please do so. If you can, give us the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment on the comment section. And if you don't know what to write, just write whatever you ate for breakfast today. That'll work. And again, thank you for all your support. Without you, I am nothing. Just in case you need an ego boost, you sadistic freak here. But anyways, let's move on here and start the show, and here it is, in focus tonight. The kabooming economy. You know, they say the soft landing is back. The economy is so strong, it's booming. Or is it kabooming? The delusional Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said, The U.S. is doing well amid economic global uncertainty in that I don't see signs of a recession in this economy at this point. Um... This is the same lady who told us that inflation is transitory, right? So let's see if this economy is doing well, as she says. And we start with some of the data that we got this week. For example, the U.S. services PMI fell to the lowest since May 2020. Everything is fine, right? Nothing to see here. The Institute for Supply Management's gauge of services retreated to 54.4 last month from 56.7 in September, according to data released Thursday. The median projection in uh, Bloomberg survey of economists was 55.3. Readings above 50 signal growth. So we went down from 56.7 to 54.4. Next thing you know, we're down below 50. Most importantly, listen to this, because the economy is in stagflation right now. What is stagflation? Inflation sticking higher, yet the pace of economic growth goes kaputs. The group's measure of business activity, which parallels the ISM's factory output gauge, declined to a five months low. And the new orders index fell to the lowest level since June. In contrast to the purchasing managers group survey for manufacturers, listen to this, the prices paid index increased and remains elevated. Elevated. Ta -da. More evidence for stagflation. And this time around, it comes from uh, this company called uh, Maersk. Maersk. I can never pronounce it right. But anyways, there was an inflation sting in Merck's, Merck's, Merck's global demand warning. One of the world's biggest shipping companies just issued a downbeat assessment of the global economy, saying container demand will fall as much as 4% this year. So inflation is going down, right? Wait for it. For those hoping this will rapidly cool inflation, it had more bad news. Alongside its demand downgrade, AP Muller Merck's AS said the price pressures that have come to dominate the post-thing uh, economy, while easing a bit, are going to stick around for a while. Why? As elevated energy prices and labor shortages prop up costs across supply chains. Da -da -da -da. The outlook for Maersk, which moves millions of containers around the world, is a fresh warning for central banks that their inflation battles may be far from over. You hear that, Mr. Powell? About 100 basis points next time. And folks, again, stagflation, inflation is really high, and inflation is wrecking havoc on American households. Listen to this. Surging rents push more Americans to live with roommates or parents. This is the American dream, right? You'll be 45 years old and you're living with mom and pop? Anyhow, U.S. households are spending 445 bucks more every month due to inflation. Now, if your employer is not giving you 500 bucks a month, or excuse me, 445 bucks a month, that's coming out of your pocket. That means you have less 
445 bucks a month to go out and splurge and hop from bar to bar and eat at restaurants. And this causes economic stagflation while inflation continues to move higher. Hence, stagflation. Why is this happening? Because you're paying more at the grocery store, utility bills, rents. Even uh, Wolfgang Puck says food inflation has gotten out of control. And Americans now say they will need one and a quarter million dollars to retire comfortably, survey finds. And in the formerly great state of California, you need about, what, three to four million dollars so you can afford a garage to retire in? Unfortunately for most Americans, personal savings have fallen off a cliff. Brace yourself for just how much they have declined. So what you hear in CNBC and all of these news outlets, the analysts, the strategists, what do they say all the time? They say, oh, the consumer is pretty healthy. The consumer is flush with cash. They have all of this savings. And they continue to stimulate the economy. Okay. The personal savings rate, meaning personal savings as a percentage of disposable income or the share of income left after paying taxes and spending money, fell to 3.3% in the third quarter. And this is down from 3.4% in the prior quarter. Now you might say, hey Maverick, this is not a big drop. What are you talking about? Well, here it is. This is the lowest level since the Great Recession and the eighth lowest quarterly rate on record since 1947. And listen to this. Adjusted for inflation, savings are down 88% from their peak in 2020 and 61% lower than before the pandemic. Whoops. The personal savings of Americans have plunged this year hitting $629 billion in the second quarter of 2022. That's uh, 10 uh, Ukrainian aid packages, right? And this is down from about $2 trillion in the second quarter of 2021. Those savings are getting burned rapidly. Listen to this. This number is down from $4.85 trillion in the second quarter of 2020, when it was boosted by uh, the thing-related government cash. Print, baby, print. And I know what you're going to say. Can say, hey, Maverick, you, you, you're basing all these numbers against inflated numbers back in 2020. You're just making this stuff up. You just want us to panic. Okay, listen to this. But it's also down from $1.41 trillion in the second quarter of 2019. Whoops. And just a reminder, 2019, before uh, the thing, a pandemic shut down the economy and led to a wave of government benefits. Before the thing, $1.41 trillion. Today, this number is down to $629 billion. Think about what you think about. Ming Li Zong, a research associate at the Urban Institute at Washington, D.C., based think tank, tank, said people will either start cutting back on spending, which could eventually help bring prices down. But of course, the zombie consumer is not going to do that because they think that their jobs are in the bag. They're never going to lose their jobs. They can swipe these credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, and buy whatever they want. So they're going to exhaust their savings by spending their income on essentials. And how about non-essentials too? In the later scenario, the U.S. would likely tip into another recession, she added. Something many economists are already forecasting for 2023. More households with little savings would have little cushion against the recession. And they're not just talking about uh, savings cushion. They're also talking about the mattress and the sofa. You're going to be forced to sell those. Your ass is sleeping on the floor. And that's if you're lucky. What happened? Question mark. A combination of wages not keeping up with inflation and people letting loose after being cooped up during the thing, many people's spending habits went into deep freeze. Even when folks were stuck at home and the only person they might see on a daily basis was the Amazon delivery person. But now, question mark, I think the gloves are off and folks are playing catch up. A yeah, catch up on digging their own graves, right? After the worst days of the pandemic, Americans wanted to be out and about. People want to experience life again and create happy memories to help replace the not so nice ones that they have from the pandemic years. They're about to have even worse ones. Just wait when the Great Depression hits. And most importantly, credit card debt rose to $887 billion in the second quarter of 2022. Wait a minute here. So credit card debt is $887 billion. Meanwhile, savings, what was that number again? Oh, $629 billion. Do you see the problem here? Anyways, that's up 13% in the year. 
the largest annual increase in 20 years as Americans continue to swipe those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. And in this kabooming economy, inflation is doing a number on small businesses. Matter of fact, the most shocking headline is more than a third of U.S. small businesses could not pay their rent in the month of October. Nothing to see here, right? Everything is going to be all right. This is a soft landing. About 37% of small businesses, which between them employ almost half of all Americans working in the private sector. Here comes the tsunami of layoffs. Anyways, we're unable to pay the rent in full in October. That is according to a survey from Boston-based Alignable a network of 7 million small business members. It is up 7 percentage points from last month and is now at the highest pace this year, the survey showed. The survey of 4,789 small business owners was conducted between October 15th and October 27th. The findings partially reflect how inflation is affecting small businesses. More than half say the rent is at least 10% higher than it was six months ago. And in seven say rents have increased at least 20%. Nobody can pay the rent, the rent, right? Be it businesses or be it individuals. Rents are going out of control. And listen to this, about 49% of restaurants are unable to pay the rent this month. 49%, almost half. Nothing to see here. And this number is up from 36% in September, while 37% of real estate agents could not pay their rent. And this is up from 27% last month, reflecting the fallout from a slowdown in home sales as higher mortgage rates chill the housing market. Look at this. In the state of Mass Hall, 51% of small businesses could not pay rent. And this is up from 32% in December 2021. And in the Garden State of New Jersey, 49% did not pay their rents in October. In New York, 45%. California, 44%. Pennsylvania, 44%. Folks, isn't this alarming? Is this really a booming economy or a kabooming economy? And now that we talked about inflation, let's talk about the recession part. Because when you combine inflation and recession, you get stagflation. Over 50% of CEOs, speaking of the Fugazi employment report that we got today, over 50% of CEOs say that they're considering cutting jobs over the next six months. So if you think that your job is in the bag and you can take rents that you cannot really afford or an auto loan that you cannot really afford, mortgage that you cannot really afford, or you're swiping those credit cards as you splurge with interest rates moving higher, buddy, you're gonna lose your job. And then what are you going to do? How are you going to pay all of these bills that you racked up? Oh, the government is going to bail you out? Is that what you said? The government is not here to bail you out. The government is here to take your money and bail out the corporations, not you. You better wake up now. Speaking of the corporations, Amazon is now pausing hiring as their stock continues to crash. A startup company called Stripe, well, they're getting rid of more than a thousand jobs. Lyft is cutting 13% of its workforce. And of course, we know that Elon Musk is getting rid of about 50% of all employees in Twitter. And folks, this is what's going on. The easy money era is gone, and the economic divorce from QE is not gonna be amicable. We're about to see societal collapse as the cheap money era ends. People are gonna be left with debt that they can no longer pay because rates are moving higher. Zombie businesses will blow up. Economies will blow up. Companies that racked up billions and billions of dollars in debt in the last 10 years or so, they're gonna slow down their capital expenditure. And instead, they're going to have to preserve money, meaning they're going to get rid of a lot of employees. They're going to have to stop buying back their shares, meaning stocks will not perform pretty good. And if you think that the Fed will come out to the rescue, buddy, you got another thing coming to you. The Fed is looking for somebody to rescue their ass. The Fed is losing hundreds of billions of dollars. As we speak right now, you think this is going to end in an amicable way? Think again. But hey, you don't have to listen to me. You can listen to Janet Yellen. You can listen to uh, this delusional Secretary of Commerce, Raimundo, who says a major U.S. recession is avoidable. And this is not a doom and gloom or gloom and doom scenario. Well, it's certainly not going to be doom and gloom for her and her billionaire husband right? But it's going to be doom and gloom for the rest of us. Average folks, we're going to pay the price. Per usual, of course. And with that, folks, let's move on to the coverage of the stock market. And we begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green up by 401.97 points or a gain of 1.26%. 
The Nasdaq up by 132.31 points or a gain of 1.28%. The S&P 500 also in the green by 50.66 points or a gain of 1.36%. When we look at the sector's performances today, number one, capturing the gold, metal, materials. Number two for the silver, financials. Number three for the bronze, communication services. All sectors managed to close in the green. Yet the laggards, healthcare, utilities, and technology. Let's contrast this with the performance for the week. And yet again, at number one, capturing the gold metal materials. Number two for the silver energy Let's give energy the bronze too because utilities barely in the green. It doesn't count. And the laggards for the week led by communication services, technology, and cyclicals. The advance to decline ratios today, NYSE 76% advancing versus 23% declining. The NASDAQ 54% advancing versus 43% declining. On to commodities in the green baby lighting up like a Christmas tree without the red of course. The only red is the United States dollar. Dollar goes down, commodities move higher. So if you think that the decline in the dollar is good for equities, think again. Sooner or later, commodities will shoot up higher, inflation will move higher, the Fed will have to come out even more aggressive than you've ever thought. Here it is, massive gains for crude. The WTI gains of about 5%. Brent closed the day with gains of over four and a quarter percent. Gasoline Arbob gains of almost one and three quarters of a percent. Heating oil gains of almost three quarters of a percent. Natural gas, aka the party boy, with massive gains worth about eight percent. And look, the tailwinds are here. The Joy B administration, they're now done with the emergency strategic reserve. They have depleted the SPR, and that's it. No more. The piggy bank is dry now, and they have to fill it up. When they fill it up, they have to pay these prices that you see right now. So when the Joey B administration says, hey, we're going to replenish this PR at 70 bucks a barrel or 80, good luck. It's going to be a hundred bucks a barrel. And now the government cash is stimulating the demand. If this continues, we could see oil at 120 by the end of the year. On top of that, inventories are extremely low at alarming levels. This is a national emergency, folks. Diesel supplies are nowhere to be found. How are we going to fill up our trucks? How are we going to transport all of these holidays products across the nation? What's going to happen in New England with heating oil at extremely low levels right now? Historic. People are going to freeze, folks. Back to the futures. Softs green across the board. Massive gains here. Led by cotton, up almost 5%. Cocoa, OJ, coffee futures, all scoring gains of over 2% for the day. Even sugar with positive gains a little over 1% and then we have lumber pretty much closing on the flat line. But the most sensitive commodities to the US dollar, metals, the dollar is down big, almost 2% for the day. Metals shooting up sky high, massive gains. Gold up, silver up, platinum up, copper up, palladium up, everything is up. Now look at these gains in copper, 8% in a single day. Silver, up over 7.5% in a single day. When it comes to meats, flattish across the board, nothing to see here. Yet when it comes to grains, we still have some decent gains across the board. Nothing compared to metals, but soybeans up, soybean meal, soybean oil, wheat, rough rice, corn, canola, all in the green. The laggard is corn, pretty much in the flat line. Now wheat made a U-turn. It shot up higher initially in the beginning of the week, and then it moved down big erasing the majority of the gains. And the reason is Russia did the U-turn, they're out of the deal, then, then in the deal again. And now Russian President Putin says he might back up from the deal again. And I say, Mr. Putin, you better make up your mind. Because I'm holding a bag here, damn it. You keep this up and I might end up uh, wearing one of those uh, saliva Ukraini pens. Anyways. On to the options market, the big casino. What's going on here? The volume moved higher. Uh, we're seeing more buying of calls here, but nothing notable. The ratios remain pretty much in the flat line. And the hottest stable today was Tesla, the souffle. At around 3 million contracts traded today, about 54% of those were puts, not calls. Then a number two Apple at around 2.6 million contracts traded today, about 50.5% of those were calls. And number three Amazon. At around 2 million contracts traded today, about 52% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in in the casino today. And we start with the ticker CVNA Carvana. And ladies and gentlemen, this name was down at some point today by more than 40% in a single day. Nothing to see here, right? These companies are about to blow up. 
to zero. We'll talk about that more in the heat map analysis. But somebody sees more pain here for Carvana, and they bought the seven and a half puts for the expiration date, December 16, with expectations that Carvana could move down and lose more than 14% of its value by then. They paid around one buck and 25 cents a piece. Standard. This trade, all in all, spending around two million dollars. And then we have two identical trades here for Google. Pick your pick. I'm gonna go with the Goog. G O O G. Double OG. Somebody sees more downside coming here for the name, and they bought the 80 puts for the expiration date, December 9, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 8% of its value by then. They paid around 1 buck and 40 cents a piece, standard. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.7 million. And then what about the disaster of Meta? Somebody sees more downside coming. They bought the 85 puts for the expiration date, December 9th, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more more than 6% of its value by then. They paid around 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all, spending around $3.6 million. And last but not least, actually it was least today, the ticker TEAM, T-E-A-M, was down at some point by about 30%. Folks, we're seeing stocks crashing by 50% in a single day. What's going on here? And somebody sees more decline to come for the ticker TEAM. They bought the 115 puts for the expiration date, January 20, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 7% of its value by then. They paid around 11 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around 8 million dollars on to the heat map analysis here's the daily heat map lighting up green for the most part technology up cyclicals up financials up pretty much everything is up the uh, commodities energy materials all up big but look at software that's risk on that's down big look at apple and tesla the institutional darling and the retail crowd darling all down for the day absent from the rally. Sure, the Chinese names were up, Alibaba, JD, Pindudu, and they lifted names such as Starbucks, Nike, all of these China-related names. But of course, with the dollar down and these Chinese hopes, which I'm pretty sure they're gonna go poof at some point. But for now, these hopes lifted metals higher. The dollar is down, China demand is hot or is supposed to be hotter at some point with the liftoffs of lockdowns or we see metals right away shooting up higher. But let's contrast this with the weekly heat map and here it is. Different picture entirely. And the majority of the pain in tech but the big caps specifically. Microsoft down over 6% for the week. Apple down over 11% for the week. Google up over or down over 10% for the week. Meta down almost 8.5% for the week. Amazon down almost 12% for the week. Tesla down over 9% for the week. Nothing to see here, right? What's working for the week? The commodities, energy, materials, that's working. The Chinese names, at least for now. In industrials, we have Boeing shot up higher, double digits, the flying coffin. But for now, folks, the take is a lot of weakness in the big caps. Bottoms don't happen when we have weakness in the big caps when they're collapsing like this. Instead, this is a beginning of an upcoming massive leg to the downside. Now this leg could be delayed because of the elections, GOP optimism, whatever, but sooner or later, reality is gonna hit. Now let's talk about some corporate news here, and we start with Amazon, and apparently Jeff Bezos is sued by a former housekeeper over working conditions and discrimination. Apparently the lady could not even take a piss. Now what's up with Jeff Bezos and uh, the obsession of watching people hold their piss? What a creep. And then we have Papa John's, and Papa John's did not do pretty good. And the excuse is, oh, the thing. The thing boosted earnings, now the thing is no longer, and people are not eating pizza anymore. Is it really that, or is it the fact that once you eat Papa John's, you're going to spend a lot of time in the toilet? Diarrhea. Speaking of diarrhea, how about Carvana? The name was down over 40% at some point during the day. The reason is, the company missed an all aspect of the car selling business. And this company is a poster boy of the print baby print era where money was cheap. They did not care how much they're gonna pay for the cars, for the inventories. You can sell a car to Carvana over the book price. They'll take it, even though the car is broken. It's the first time in history where you get to scam the dealer, not the other way around. But they did not care. All what they cared about is accumulating as much inventory as they can so they can sell it at a higher price. But at some point, this mania came to an end because the consumer is now getting squeezed, paying more for gas, for rents, for utilities, for food. They can no longer take loans and buy used cars. All of a sudden, Carvana is left holding the bag. And of course, Morgan Stanley says the stock is going down to one 
dollar a share. I say how about zero? That's what's going to happen. But rest assured, the Garcias, the CEO of the company, oh, they dumped billions worth of shares right at the top last year. And they left the mom and pop investors holding the bag. The geniuses who said, oh, Carvana is the future, bro. You don't understand. Uh, someday it's going to be bigger than Amazon. Oh, really? And then we have updates on the new, on the whole, um, Elon Musk Twitter saga. Elon Musk is now getting hit. All of these advertisers, as I told you, are saying sayonara, goodbye. You like free speech? We don't like free speech. We want censorship. To uh, protect democracy, we gotta impose some tyranny. Rest in peace, free speech in America. And of course, now it's up to Elon to deal with this, and he has no idea how to deal with this. He overpaid Number one, he either has to sell the company at a loss or he has to monetize it somehow by user's money instead of ads, which is more challenging. Companies such as General Mills, Audi, Pfizer, and many more are boycotting ads on Twitter. I thought freedom of speech was given to us by the founding father. Now I have to be given freedom of speech by a South African immigrant. That's how bad the situation is getting in this country. And of course, the workers, he's going to lay off about 50% of workers. The ad money's down big. He's not going to be able to afford to pay all of these people, so goodbye. But these folks are now suing Elon Musk. This is a whole mess. It's a fiasco. And I said, this will be the beginning of the end of Elon Musk. He got into a trap, and he's not going to be able to get out of it without getting wounded. In the meantime, if you're going to play social media, how about Dwack the Quack? DWAC, which is owned by uh, former President Fanta Claus, and today he said there was a very, very probably, very probably, that I'm going to run for president again. So I say this is an opportunity to buy Dwack the Quack until the deep staters give him the uh, JFK treatment. But until then, Dwack the Quack could be a good investment. Anyhow, moving on to the, before we they cancel the channel, anyways, let's move on. To the heat map analysis, and here it is. This is a weekly heat map for the ETFs. And again, the majority of the gains, not in tech, not the XLK. The XLK is down over 6.5% for the week. Chips did a lot better because the dollar is down. But the majority of the gains, energy ETFs, XOP up over 4% for the day. XLE up almost 2.5% for the week. I should say, OIH up almost 6% for the week. Silver, the SLV up big for the week. Even gold miners, GDX scored gains of about 1% for the week. Natural gas, UNG, the ticker BOIL, boil up massively for the week. Uh, once again, value is at performing growth. Growth down big, the IWF down over 5.5% for the week. IWD down for the week, but only down by about 1%. When it comes to international markets, in the green for the week, for the most part, pretty much all of them, and the majority of the gains led by the EWZ Brazil after the elections of Lula, and of course the Chinese ETFs, FXI, MCHI, and this impacts the double EM. I doubt that these gains will hold. On to the charts analysis, and we start with SPY, S&P 530 minutes chart. What's going on here? Yesterday, the chart went below. 373 and a half and it looked really bad then came the pop today in the morning with the dollar moving down but the chart failed again and it went below 373 and a half this was a shorting signal a second failure of an important support and therefore i say today was a pie in the face kind of day because by the end of the day here comes the rescue mission again and they pumped the chart to close above 373 and a half all in all is there anything significant here the answer is no the chart remains negative. The reversal already happened, but the bulls can take a victory in closing the week above 373 and a half. I would say this alone shows that the bulls are not dead yet. They want to do something else here. They're planning for something else here. It could be desperation. It could be that they're not getting it yet, but it could also be, hey, if, if the pivot thing did not work, let's do the GOP elections rally because it happens all the time. Okay, let's play that game. In the meantime, the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500, any change here? None at all. I would say the bulls eked a little victory here in closing the week above 3,720 and a half. But the bad news is, how long will they hold on to the support? The answer is not for long. Look at the volume moving above average, the RSI getting weaker, the MACD is about to cross to produce negative impressions in the histogram. These are all indicators that the chart sooner or later will lose 3,720 and a half of support. But even if that happens, the June bottom is still intact, 3,600. Unlike the Qs, of course, which lost its June bottom for good. And hence the contrast between value and growth. Value 
oil, materials, the defensives, health care. This is what's keeping the SPY holding on to the June bottom. But tech, that's already gone. Here's a weekly chart for the SPX, the cash index for the S&P 500. Despite today's gain, does it change anything at all? The answer is no. We have a weekly closing below 3,800. 3,800 is gone now. And the next test becomes 3,500. The volume moved way above average and the momentum indicators are weakening. Look at the MACD indicator. If it fails to cross, so far it is failing. But if it does by next week, and we see it curling down and the red impressions get larger, buckle up, we have a massive downside coming for the S&P. 3,500 is not going to hold. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? The June bottom is gone. 269.29. That's puff gone. We're now looking at 261.69. The chart flushed down all the way to this number. And now it is consolidating back and forth, back and forth. Of course, it appeared that the Qs will lose 261.69 by the end of the day. Then came the rescue mission by the end of the day, and the chart closed above it. So the bulls can take a little victory here that they kept 261.69 as support by the end of the week. But make no mistake, the reversal already happened, and for the Qs to cross above 269.29 easily, that's not going to happen. It's going to be a tough job. It's going to take um, more than election optimism to do the job. On to the daily chart for the Qs, continuous contract, what's going on here? The June bottom is gone as support for now, we have a confirmation, 11,058.5, that's puff, gone, the volume went above average for the week, the momentum indicator is a weakening, we have a confirmation on the MACD indicator, that the positive momentum is over, so we have support at the previous low, but if that's broken, let's say after we get the uh, elections rally, whatever, CPI comes out ugly, Q's goes down. We have to look at the weekly chart here for the NDX this time around. And by the way, the numbers are going to be close, be it the continuous contract or the NDX. But for a weekly chart, I like to use the NDX because this is the number that everybody's going to talk about in the media. So if this plays out, and so far, it appears that it is. Look at the MACD indicator. It is curling down, indicating more losses to come. If this happens, we have a downside of about 13% to come, and the support would be 9,576. The IWM, the ad performer, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got the flush down, but the chart caught support at the most important number of 174.22. And the rebound got the chart all the way to close the gap. But here's the problem. Yesterday, it failed to close the day above the gap. So right away in the morning, morning today, the chart attempted to finish the job. And it went above the gap and it traded a little bit above the gap for a while, only to go down and lose that gap and it was a shorting signal, hence the pies. Because by the end of the day, the chart moved higher again and it closed above the gap. Now options expiration, maximum pain, the dealer is playing a lot of games, we know all of that. So the real reaction here will happen next week. And my hunch is, the reversal already happened and the IWM will not stay above 174.22 for too long. Here is the weekly chart for the IWM. Again, we have a sloping line of resistance. We have lower highs, but for now we have a double bottom. If the chart manages to crack above the sloping line of resistance and close above this line for the week, this will be a bullish development for the Russell 2000. Unlike the Qs, Look at the MACD indicator. It is still showing positive impressions, and hence the ad performance of the IWM versus the Qs. Now, the IWM includes uh, the um, small, high beta natural gas and oil plays, and these have been outperforming so far. The regional banks, these have been outperforming as of late. So this is helping the IWM to stay afloat. But the question becomes, how long will the ad performance last amidst an upcoming recession? And here's the Dixie, the dollar index, the most important chart for the day. Massive reversal candle here, erasing about two days, three days worth of gains. The dollar could not make it above the trend line again. It got rejected. It lost 113 as support. It lost 111 and a half as support. And the next step would be 110 once again. The RSI reversed the negative divergence, only to fall back into negative divergence again. The MACD indicator is curling down. All roads are leading to Rome. What is Rome in this case? the dollar going down. Now, before we make this assumption, was today's action based on a mechanical reason that will fade away next week, as we've seen with Apple after earnings? And I told you Apple is not going to last above 150 for too long. It was due to a mechanical reason. Once the mechanical reason is over, the stock goes down. Are we seeing the same thing with the dollar here? Maybe the dollar is playing possum because we have a mechanical reason today, and then it pops higher next week. So far, I'm not seeing that. 
I'm not seeing a mechanical reason that pushed the dollar down today and this reason is going to fade away next week. Because think about the headwinds here. Number one, other currencies are moving higher. Other central banks are about to play catch up with the Fed. The Fed gave them the green light to tighten even more. And hence, Canadian dollar, Kiwi, Australian dollar, the yen all moving higher. This will add some pressure on the dollar. Now, of course, the ultimate confirmation would be making a new lower low, but this has yet to happen. But from all the information that we got right now, is the trajectory up or down? The answer is down. So you know how to trade now. What goes up when the dollar goes down? That's your quiz. Go back to the intro and find the answer. And here's gold, the old man, in the room, and it is moving higher closing above 1,671, one cent for all. Here's your confirmation that the dollar is going down. Gold will outperform, metals will outperform, oil will outperform, maybe chips will outperform too. Unless, of course, what we got today is a fake out. We see gold moving down again, dollar moving higher again. For now, I have no reason to doubt the move in gold or the dollar. And here's the daily chart for Brent Oil. What's going on here? The ABC pattern on track, the chart now facing the resistance at around 98, and if it passes, it goes all the way to 105.43. Now pay attention here. When we look at the XLE, the ETF for energy, notice this pattern. We got a top back in, uh, let's say, April, May, and since then, the XLE and energy moved down. And then, slowly but surely, the XLE rolled its way higher again to the same high. It made a higher low and it's now battling the same resistance, the double top if you may, from earlier this year. Now the question becomes, is it going to fail? Is it going to move down? Because if that is the case, it is a shorting opportunity. It is a profit taking opportunity if you, if you happen to be long energy for a while. And here's my answer. The dollar is moving down. Is this positive or negative for energy? The answer is it is positive. From a technical standpoint, look at the MACD indicator in the weekly chart of the XLE. It is moving higher. It is producing positive impressions on the histogram, indicating higher highs to come. The only headwind that I see uh, in the horizon now is the windfall tax, which is probably not going to happen. But a GOP win is also bad for energy because if the Republicans are going to open the spigots, supply goes higher, price goes down. So believe it or not, Joey B is the best thing that ever happened to oil and gas companies. They're not going to tell you that, but they love the guy. Keep finding us and the prices will go higher and higher and higher. This is good for oil and gas companies. But the proof that the XLE will move higher eventually and make a higher high by looking at some of the components of the XLE that made a higher high. This is a leading indicator. The XLE will follow through and perhaps the laggards in oil and gas will also move higher and make a new higher high. ExxonMobil weekly chart. It passed the previous high weeks ago and it continues to move higher. MPC Marathon Petroleum passed the test, made a new high. Chevron still battling but it's about to make a new higher high. COP ConocoPhillips made a new high already, passed the test. Now the laggards, Devon, DVN was down big this week because the dividend got reduced, but immediately the aggregate demand kicked in. A lot of folks bought the dip in DVN and it moved higher again. Sooner or later, my hunch is it will pass above the previous high. VLO, Valero, weekly chart. We have massive gains since the last time we talked about this name. Look at the MACD, look at the RSI. There's no doubt, at least right now, looking at the chart, the VLO will move all the way to challenge the previous high and perhaps pass above it, just like Exxon did, just like Marathon did. Another laggard is HAL, a weekly chart for Halliburton. It is accelerating its way higher, but it has a long way to go. The question becomes, is it going to make a new high just like Exxon? And the bigger question is, if you're going to buy energy right now, Suppose we get a pullback because we have a resistance from a previous high, a double top if you may, the XLE. Do you buy the momentum, the ad performers, the names that already made a higher high, Exxon, Marathon, Conoco, etc.? Or do you buy the laggards? Is the opportunity in laggards, Devon, Halliburton, and many other names? The honest answer is, I have no idea. Usually you stick with momentum. You stick with the names that already passed the test. But again, is the opportunity in the laggards who are about to make the same move as Exxon? I'll leave the answer to this question to you entirely. I am exposed both ways, in the laggards and the outperformers. I have both in my portfolio. Now, what about the 10-year yield? What's going on here? Notice the dollar was down big, yields holding steady. And despite a lot of talk that I heard today in TV that yields are topping, I disagree. I think Jerome Powell told us that yields are going higher. Sooner or later, this chart will make a higher high. I don't see the reversal right now. 
I see some resistance coming up. You can see the line in pink or, or purple, whatever that is. But the point being here is, if yields are about to move higher, how sustainable the rally would be in tech, real estate, home builders, utilities, maybe not very sustainable. So I'm sticking with the dollar. The dollar goes down, good for metals, good for oil. And if you must buy tech, stick to chips so long as the dollar continues to move down. Here's the TLT daily chart. It appears that the reverse ABC pattern on track about to go down all the way to 87.94. Another indicator that the 10 year is about to go higher. And here it is, the VIX, the mystery of the VIX. Market goes down, the VIX goes down along with it. This is the four hours chart. The momentum is now back to negative. What's going on here? Number one, the chart caught support at 24.29. Is it going to hold? Is it not going to hold? I have no idea. But why is the VIX down? The answer is no appetite for hedging. For whatever reason, the market remains stubborn. That's sure, we did not get the pivot optimism from the Fed. But what about the midterm optimism? Do I really need to hedge right now? Or should I double down on buying calls? The market remains delusional, which gives you the opportunity if you happen to be bearish and you have a degree of conviction that the equities market is going to go down further to accumulate puts right now. Because so long as the VIX is down, puts are getting cheaper. They might not stay cheap for too long. What's going to happen in the next CPI? If that's a shocker, my hunch is you will see all of this energy in the VIX exploding higher. It will be way above 33. We're talking in the 40s territory. And here's Apple, 15 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got a bear flag after bear flag after yet another bear flag. Today, the chart went down initially only to go higher above 138.79. And it could not make it. Unlike Microsoft, unlike Google, this was the weakest chart in the queues. It could not close above 138.79. The good news is it is still holding at 134.37 as support. But how long will this hold? The relative weakness in Apple is extremely concerning now. Because when we look at the chart from a weekly perspective, what do we see here? A sloping line of resistance. The chart was supposed to go all the way and challenge the line. It reversed before doing so, for now it's making a higher low, but we have a negative divergence on the RSI. The MACD indicator is curling its way down. It will fail to cross, it appears for now. If that is the case, the chart will indeed violate the laws. It will make a new lower low. And can the market really rally without Apple, the big kahuna? I doubt it. What about Tesla? 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Another flush down. It lost 217.88 of support. And today it lost 206.86 of support. It closed slightly above it after the rescue operation by the end of the day, but it remains an underperformer. It is showing a bear flag pattern yet again. Sooner or later, this name is going back to 200. We'll see if this is going to hold or not. And lastly, tulips. BTC. What's going on? here it made a new higher high the bulls are in charge now the dollar goes down magically btc shoots up higher so your question now might be hey maverick how high where tulips go the answer to that is how low will the dollar go theoretically btc has the room to go all the way to twenty-seven thousand, but this will only happen if the dollar continues to go down absent of that the bratty is not sustainable it goes bust right away and lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar next week? Monday the 7th, we have consumer credit. We have a bunch of zombies from the Fed speaking, Loretta Mister and then um, Tom Barkin. And maybe they're going to reveal their latest insider trading moves. We'll see. And Tuesday the 8th, we have Elections Day along with the Small Business Index. Wednesday the 9th, we have uh, New York Fed Williams, formerly known as the King of the Doves. Speaking, along with another day of Tom Barkin, we also have a revision for wholesale inventories. And then Thursday the 10th, busy day, the most important day, we have the CPI, aka the CP lie, we have initial jobless claims, and we have uh, Governor Waller speaking, who came out a little too hawkish last time around. And lastly, Friday the 11th, we have yet again Harker from the Philly Fed. We also have the Dallas Fed, Lori Logan speaking, Esther George from Kansas City, again with Loretta Mister from Cleveland, and the man formerly known as the King of Doves, John Williams from the New York Fed. Lots of Fed zombies this week. And then, of course, we have the most important event, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again over the weekend. And, of course, for the members on Monday. In the meantime, have a great weekend and good night. Go home. Forget this thing. 
I can recognize an obsession. No good will come of it. What hasn't good come of your obsessions? Well, at first, but I followed them too long. I am their slave. And one day they will choose to destroy me. If you understand an obsession, then you know you won't change my mind. So be it. Okay.